I see it's 2.30. I'd like to welcome everyone. Hello. Welcome to this National Trust Foundation webinar on identity theft and financial fraud. I'm Linda Topham Streitfeld. I'm the Director of Programs here at NTF. I'm joined today by Aviva Leighton. She is a Vice President and Distinguished Analyst at Gartner Research, who has specialized for several decades, we won't talk about how many, uh, in security and privacy. For those who don't know us, the National Trust Foundation And we encourage questions. Today, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time during Aviva's presentation. We'll take them in the order that we get them, although we may wait for a break or we may wait until the end of the presentation, and we'll get to as many as we can. By tomorrow, we expect to have a link to a recorded version of this webinar on our website. And we also, if you registered in advance for the webinar, we'll send you the recorded version in an email. So you can share it with friends or you can post it to social media. So today we are not gonna focus on the National Security Agency and whose emails it seems to have collected. Instead, we're gonna talk about different kinds of privacy breaches that cost banks and businesses and individuals a lot of time and a lot of money. So Aviva, welcome. I know you've brought along some very cool slides today, and I'm going to give you a minute to share your slides. We'll just do a little technical sleight of hand uh, so people can see them. Now, I want to also tell our viewers that when the slides come up, and right now I don't have a box asking you to share the slides, so as soon as I see that, I will share them. So for viewers, when the slides come up, you have the option of seeing them in full screen, or you can see them a little bit smaller and uh, open up the rest of your screen. So if you want to chat a question at any point, just use, you should see a small um, full screen button at the top right. That's a toggle. So if you click on that button, you'll see the chat box, and if you click again, the slides will be full screen. So you can play around with that, but you have control of the format on your own computer. So, uh, Aviva, if you're ready to go. Okay, thank you, Linda. Uh, I'm talking today about the cyber threat landscape, and it's a topical discussion because probably most of you have heard about the NASDAQ site being down. We're not sure what happened. We don't know who's doing it but we know there could be many different possibilities. And in fact, there are many different trends in fraud and cyber attacks, which we'll look at today. This is just a highlight of some of the things that we all need to worry about in our organization. Over on the right, you see the high bandwidth distributed denial of service attacks. And these are the types of attacks that have been flooding mainly bank websites over the past year and rendering their service inoperable for at least a few hours. And this has hit all the major banks in the United States. We're also on the left seeing that the bad guys are now going after employees because employees have a lot more privileges. They can actually do a lot more damage if you take over their account. Uh, and that's where many of the fraudsters are going. Further down on the left, we still have low tech insider fraud. We talk a lot about the high-tech stuff, but we can't forget that some people say, some stats say about 60% of insider fraud is just done by regular employees doing regular commands that they have access to, and one of those incidents can cause millions of dollars in damage. We also have social engineering of call center representatives. Many institutions are tightening up their online control, so the bad guys have discovered call center representatives that are often very nice and polite and trying to help are really good targets for social engineering and eventual account takeovers. There's also advanced threats. You have to assume, and I don't mean to sound extremist here, but probably every single one of the Fortune 1000 companies has been infiltrated by cyber spies. These may be nation states, such as the Chinese, which has been pretty well documented, or 
it could actually be just um, a competitor trying to get competitive secrets. But you have to assume if you're one of these companies, and even if you're below the Fortune 1000 tier, that the cyber spies are already in your network. Over on the right, besides the high bandwidth attacks, we're seeing mobile uh, attacks. So now when you download a mobile application, that may have bad stuff in it called malware. There's data breaches where um, the bad guys are going into databases that are outside your control, the individual's control. This could be at retailers, at uh, restaurants, and getting your credit card information, for example. A lot of the electronic data out there, in fact, most of it is completely out of your control, and it's being breached. And then finally, there's human in the middle attacks where people are showing up, the bad guys are showing up at people's doors pretending to be police or bank officers saying, oh, we're here to help you, your account's been raided, sign these papers and we'll transfer all the money to another account automatically. And nice believing people are trusting these people that show up at the door. They may even call you. So this is just a flavor of all the different kinds of attacks that we're seeing today. And now in the next 45 minutes, we'll look at more deeply into the cyber threats and who are these bad guys? What kind of actors are they? We'll look at what the current cyber war looks like. Then we'll look at financially motivated attacks and what they look like and how they're affecting individuals and businesses. We'll take a little time to look at consumer reaction to all this. And finally, we'll wrap up by looking how our legislature and the, um, the regulatory bodies are responding to all these new threats. So let's start by looking at the actors. Who's out there committing all these crimes? Well, this gives you a flavor of the four types of actors that we see that are committing crimes against individuals and businesses using cyberspace. And down at the bottom, it's all out cyber war. And up at the top, it's financial crime. So let's look at some of these actors. At the top, we see cyber criminals or insiders. Many of them are from Eastern Europe, uh, and they're very well trained in computers. And what they're doing is going after the money. So they go after people's bank accounts, and they steal money out of them. And the outcome is the person loses money. And that's what we've seen mainly in the past five to 10 years. But then along came the hacktivists. Uh, the most well-known is Anonymous, uh, and they started just attacking to make political or social statements. So, for example, they attacked MasterCard, PayPal, and Visa because they weren't enabling donations to the WikiLeaks founder, uh, and they were trying to make a statement that if you're not going to let donations to Julian Assuage, then we're not going to let anyone access your, your service. The third category are the cyber espionage actors. These are um, you know, what's widely thought to be mainly Chinese, but of course it's also other kinds of competitors. And what are they after? They're after theft of intellectual property. So they're going into all kinds of companies, whether they're perfume companies stealing their formulas, whether they're chip manufacturers, Get their designs, law firms trying to get information on their on their lawsuits. Out for intellectual property theft and financial gain, and sometimes they're out for revenge um, against this. And then the last category that we've started. And it is widely known that they've been attacking the U.S. bank website. This has also been attacking Iran with uh, cyber war. We all heard about Stuxnet that was done in conjunction with the U.S. Israeli government. Um, and so, what these category, what this category represents, is nation states conducting war in this new frontier. So when we look at something like the NASDAQ shutdown, it really could be the first category or the last category. You know, I'm not really sure. I don't think anyone's come out and said what it is yet, but it could be a nation state that's trying to make a political statement and disrupt U.S. business, 
or it could be real cyber criminals and or insiders trying to take over the exchange for financial gain. So hopefully the truth will come out eventually. So let's look at some summary statistics on who was breached in 2012. This comes from Verizon Business Services, and they put out a pretty comprehensive report. This is from their latest report. They analyzed almost 50,000 security incidents and 620 confirmed breaches in 2012, and they looked at who was getting breached. So this is not an all-inclusive survey, but it's based on their very good data set. So over a third of the breaches were against financial organizations. About a quarter were against retail environments and restaurants. 20% uh, of network intrusions were against manufacturing, transportation, and utilities. So these were actual intrusions. Business firms, like law firms, accounting firms, system integration firms, and almost 40% of all the breaches and intrusions were against large organizations. And who perpetrated the breaches? Almost all of them were perpetrated by outsiders, and these are not mutually exclusive categories, but another 14% were committed by insiders. So just by looking at the stats, you can tell there was collusion between outsiders and insiders. Very small amount implicated business partners, 7% in, uh, involved multiple parties, and almost 20% were attributed to these state-affiliated actors. So that's a very high number being conducted by nation states. So let's delve deeper into the nation state category and look at what does cyber war actually look like. Well, as far as I can tell, cyber war started in earnest in January 2012. And that was, uh, here's a report from Bloomberg, and that was the time when Hamas actually praised an internet hack against Israel. And these hacks were done against the Al Al website and also the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. And Hamas actually came out and said, oh, now we have a new way of attacking the Zionist enemy, and this is a great new weapon. And we actually learned that the code that they used, that the bad guys used in that attack, was very similar to the code that was used to attack the U.S. banks that the Iranians launched um, a few months ago. So that, as far as I can tell, is when cyber war started in earnest. There's been discussions about it. There's been some hints of it, like the Estonian government's website was taken down years ago. But it really started in earnest in January 2012. One thing we also have to remember is cyber war is not only against websites and electronic um, operations, it can also include physical attacks on the communications infrastructure. So the internet runs over cables that go underwater, and there were actually a few Egyptian divers that were caught off the coast of Egypt trying to cut these cables that manage the traffic between India and South Asia and, the, and Egypt. And when these uh, people were caught in the act, and it was the second time there was such an act in the last year, uh, the thinking was that it, this, again, was a political motivation, and it was related to the Arab uprising um, and the, you know, the political dissonance and trying to get free speech cut off. So uh, that's something that we kind of forget to think about, that the internet is in cyberspace, but it's also underwater, under the sea, in these cables. Now, what do the distributed denial of service attacks against the US banks look like? So there's these things called botnets. I don't know if you've heard of botnets, but basically what happens is the bad guys take over our PCs. So many PCs in schools, in um, your homes, in any kind of office setting can be used as a criminal botnet. And a botnet is basically a group of computers that is used to launch attacks. So they don't use their own computers, they use someone else's. Well, with these high bandwidth attacks, 
they were different than what we've seen before. What the Iranians did, they launched 100 gigabits a second of bandwidth against these U.S. bank websites. Up until now, the average was below 20. And they did that by taking over servers that had very high bandwidth connectivity to the Internet. Now, the interesting thing is they only used a third of the capacity. So they had all this capacity on the side that they could actually do more damage. And they stopped almost voluntarily, probably because they didn't want to get shut down or taken down. But they could have kept going, which is what one of the interesting phenomena here is they had more power than they used. And they pretty much stopped voluntarily. In fact, they stopped for a couple months during the Iranian election, and then they came back after the election, as many predicted they would. So far, most of the attacks have been uh, you know, pretty harmless in the sense that they're only taking down the websites. They're not doing any damage to the back office systems. But recently, we have seen cases of fraud that have been conducted where money leaves the systems during these DDoS attacks. But in that case, it doesn't look like the Iranians. It looks like copycats or different people that are emulating these distributed denial of service tactics to distract bank security from their job so they can go steal money out of the account. So what's happening today in NASDAQ is anyone's guess. But it could be one of these attacks where they just are launching attacks against the service, not just the website, but the applications itself, and just hitting it with so much traffic that they can't keep up with these requests and it has to shut down. So this is something all security analysts and researchers and government officials are keeping a very close eye on. Um, and it's really exposed some very basic vulnerabilities that relate to how dependent we are on the internet. So let's move on then from cyber war and look at how do the bank account takeovers work? How do the financially motivated attacks work against individuals and businesses? So what I'm going to show you here is a typical week or month in the, in the life of criminals that are trying to take money out of bank accounts. And they've been very successful with this technique. So in the first week, the hacker will set up and rent the technical infrastructure. These financial crime groups are very well organized, like small businesses. And you can just rent whatever you need. If you're a hacker, you can rent different kits. You can rent botnets and computers. You can rent people that go to machines and cash out if you're going to an ATM machine. So it's very well structured. So they start by getting into that infrastructure, renting what they need. Then they get a victim list. And they usually get these victim lists through these breaches that we've all heard about, like the breach of the Sony PlayStation Network you probably all heard about. And I don't need to mention all of them, but lots of email addresses are stolen. And email addresses are very valuable. Um, so now the hacker can go get a whole bunch of stolen emails and figure out which people he's interested in based on portfolios that they have of individuals with either lots of money or that are treasurers and businesses. So they figure out who their targets are by combining all this information and they get to them through these stolen email clips. At the same time, when they, they're this is a very targeted attack. They also figure out, OK, if I'm going to take over this guy's bank account, and let's say he's the treasurer for a very big corporation, I know that the bank is not going to let me transfer money out of his account unless they ask me those secret questions that you probably all have to answer, and unless they call the person to make sure this wire transfer is something they really want to execute. So the hacker, it, ahead of time, gets all that information. So he steals those knowledge-based authentication records out of the data aggregator databases. And I won't bore you with the details, but all these questions are stored in databases. And they can steal them relatively easily. Let it, me stop you for yeah. a second. That's so frightening. Uh -huh. So PDA is knowledge-based authentication. authentication. Right. Okay. Sorry, I should have so written it out. No, it's, it wouldn't fit in your box. Right. And that's like you've probably tried to do something risky and been asked those questions. Like, um, I, I don't have to do anything risky. I just forget my password. Yeah. And then I, 
then I have to remember where did I go to school? Yeah, right. So that that's risky though for getting having a reset of passwords. Yeah. So those questions are in a database and they go out and steal it. Um, also, they forward the phone. So let's say they know you're going to get the call because it's your bank account they're taking over. They'll find out where your phone service is. Let's say it's Verizon. And they'll call Verizon and pretend they're you and say, hi, my uh, landline's broken. Can you please forward all my calls to this other call, a number, and the customer support representative in the call center will say, sure, what's your name, what's your account number, what's your date of birth, and that's all data that the criminal has. So now, when the bank goes to call you, the criminal is actually going to get the call. So this is the social engineering you were referring to earlier. Exactly. Nice people on the other end of the call center right. who really want to help. Right. I wish I found some of those. <laughs> the criminals find them very easily. And honestly, they go back to the same people repeatedly because they find out who in the call center is the nicest and willing to help, and somehow they figure out how to get to them. So now the bad guy is all equipped. He's got the email address. He stole the records, the knowledge based authentication records. He forwarded the phone. So now he sends a spear phishing email. Spear phishing means it's a targeted email with a malware attachment. So there's some bad software in an attachment in that email. Now the email may say, hi John, your bonus is ready, click here to see it. Now who's not going to click on that attachment? So now John gets the email, he clicks on the attachment, and lo and behold, there's malware on his desktop. Malware is basically a name for malicious software, and now that software is recording everything he does and is ready to steal money from his bank account. So now the user, John, let's say, again, he's a treasurer for a major corporation. He goes in, he logs into the bank, and this says the hacker breaks the one-time password security. So John's logged into his bank, and he has to log in with a one-time password. I don't know if you've seen those little tokens that generate a one-time password. Well, he just waits, the hacker waits for John to log in, and now John logs in with the one-time password, and the hacker goes in right after him, because he waits for, the program waits for him to log into the bank, and then he moves money without John seeing what he's doing. It's a, a technical technique where he hides his tracks. So now the bank calls John, supposedly, to say, okay, did you really want to transfer the $600,000? And, but the call is forwarded to the hacker, and the hacker answers the phone, the bank thinks it's called John, and now the bank asks what it thinks is John, all these secret questions, and the hacker answers them perfectly successfully, and now the hacker moves $650,000 from John's account to his offshore account. Now this is not fiction, this has happened time and time again over the last few years, and John may not find out about this until he gets his written statement because if he goes in online to see it, the bad guys hide the money transfers from John and they'll overwrite it with what his previous balance is so he won't see that this money was taken out. So um, there's a lot to be said about this, you know, the, about the, the protections that John has. Put it this way, John doesn't have a lot of protections if he's a business. And he is a business. Consumers are protected, but John may never get his money back. And this has happened to many small businesses, and they've actually sued their banks to get their money back, and they've lost most of the time. So we talked about how the strong authentication was broken. I'm not going to go through all these details, but what I want to just point out is when you put that one-time password in your browser, the bad guy just waits for you to put that in. So anything that goes through a browser doesn't mean anything anymore to the hackers because they just wait for you to authenticate and then they go do their thing. The same thing when someone calls you, if your bank calls you or some business calls you, just keep in mind that those phone calls can all be forwarded. Um, and I've talked to many financial institutions that have seen these things in action. So again, uh, this, is a, this is a daily occurrence almost. Let me ask a question. Is sure. it possible for a bank to have something in place that can tell it when a call has been, an outgoing call is being forwarded? 
Yes, there, there are systems that can tell you if the call is forwarded. They're not perfect. Um, they depend on the carriers following a certain protocol. Uh -huh. And if they're all using that same protocol, you can see if the call is forwarded. But they obviously don't always use it. They don't use it. But if you raise a really good question. We're not going to get into the solutions here, but there are solutions for all of this. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason these bad guys have to win. There's plenty of technology, lots of innovation. You just have to spend the money on it, and you have to organize your process and your people to deal with it. But all of this can be stopped. I'm going to quickly go through the next scheme. I don't know if you've heard about the ATM flash tax, where they take millions of dollars around the world out of the ATM machine. Well, this is a, a one case on how it works, so I'll go through this a little more quickly. This was, um, I don't know if you've heard about the attack against Michael's Art Stores about a year or two ago. This is basically Michael, Michael's Art Store attack. So the hackers actually go out there and study the point of sale equipment. So there's different manufacturers that make this cash register equipment, and they figure out which equipment they can reverse engineer, and then they figure out which retailers have them. So now they found um, a group of retailers, we'll call it Michaels, that have this certain equipment that they knew how to reverse engineer. So they go into these stores, usually at very odd hours, and they distract the cashiers, say, can you please help me find something for my daughter's birthday party? And the cashier goes, yeah, sure, I'll help, and walks away to help the bad guy. And the other bad guy comes in and puts a skimmer device really quickly in that uh, reader where you put your pen and your card. So now those, those devices are compromised. So now there's millions of people going through these stores, and this happens around the country, and the data is being skimmed. When people put their pins in, they're capturing that with membranes on the keypad sometimes and different methods or cameras. And all that data is going to a foreign server somewhere in Eastern Europe usually. And now the hackers take all that stolen data and sort it by bank. Card issuing VIN is just bank identification number. So they sort it by bank and they create these clone payment cards by bank. They attach a sticker with the pin right on the card. And then they go line up what they call their mules, like these, you know, hack, hackies. I don't know what you call them, lackeys. That have, you know, they're pretty desperate people because they don't mind going to the ATM machine and making videos. Um, and they go bank by bank, you know, those card issuing banks. So let's say they'll do Citibank cards first and then Chase cards next and then Wells cards. And they go out there, they get these guys to go across the country to different ATMs, sometimes in different countries, and they go one bank at a time, and they go 10 minutes at a time. So they'll go for 10 minutes, take whatever money they can get, go home, come back, and the issuing banks are caught off guard because they're going only one bank at a time. So if Chase complains to Visa, Visa will say, well, it's only your problem. No one else is calling. So once they get a few calls, then they figure out where the point of compromise are. So they've... Uh, They've been pretty good at this, and in fact, we heard about one of these ATM attacks just, I think it was last Christmas, where they got, I think it was 22 or $40 million within, like, two days. So um, this is pretty much how they do it. I'm not going to go through this slide in the interest of time, but I do want to illustrate what I mentioned before, that after they take money out of an online account, they hide their tracks. So if you go back in to look at your account and they've taken money out, you're not going to see it. So that's why I recommend printing reports, because they don't bother uh, masquerading in print. Now what about mobile? Well, mobile comes with its whole new set of threats. And we all have probably seen these statistics before. Gartner has some really great data if you're interested in the growth of mobile. We had a half a billion smartphones in 2010. That was two and a quarter billion in 2012. I think it's like three and a half billion already. Smartphones are like the new desktop. As we all know, we probably all of us have smartphones. Um, and the conventional techniques to protect those uh, desktops are not really working yet on mobile. So we're seeing a lot of mobile malware 
And in fact, this comes from a security firm called Kaspersky that they saw malware on smartphones increase more than 780% in 2012. And most of this is targeted towards Android. So 99% of mobile malware is targeting the Android um, phones because they're much more open environments. And this is not an ad for Apple, but if, but you're, it's like it is. <laughs> but if you're worried about security, you're better off with an iPhone. Now, most of the malware is called SMS grabbers. So what these SMS grabbers do and I, um, is basically they divert the SMS messages. So sometimes your bank will send you a text to say, do you really want to uh, do this transaction? So those messages are being diverted to the criminal. Um, this slide is just talking about how does the malware get on the phone? Um, it basically comes through the app store, and when you go into your application on your mobile phone, now it's being listened to by this malware. So this slide is basically telling us that once the malware is on your phone, it can do anything it wants. It can route your phone calls. It can route your SMS messages. It can change your transactions. It can even listen to your voice call because now it's got all these channels available to it. So the way the, the SMS grabber works is um, it's similar to what we looked at before with the pant takeover. The hacker needs to get this malware on the phone, right? So he's got to get into the app stores. So he will buy what's called Google Play developer accounts for about $100 on the black market. Because the Google Play app store has developer accounts that are able to put applications in the app store. So now he's, the bad guy has one of these accounts. Then he goes and buys a kit for the malware. In this case, it was called Percolay. And they were targeting 70 global banks that use SMS text messaging to confirm your transaction. So now the targeted victim is logging into the bank. They get a piece of code that was injected that says, oh, you need a new piece of security software downloaded to your phone so we can strengthen the authentication process. And now the person on the other end says, oh, my bank's doing a great job protecting me. I'm going to like download this special security certificate they've asked me to do. And that way, I'm going to have even better security. In fact, a lot of the malware guys hide behind security software. They pretend that they're giving you really strong security software when they're actually infecting you. So now the victim enters his mobile number. He's asked to enter it, and he gets an SMS message and a link to download the malware. So now the malware is on the phone. And to make a long story short, when the bank sends a message to the victim with the uh, SMS message saying, do you really want to do this transfer, the SMS message is going to a different phone. So that's basically how it works. And um, I think the moral of the story is, is don't count on anything. Like, you're not completely safe anywhere. Very, very frightening. But you wouldn't let me spend time on the solution. <laughs> we might get to that. We'll have a second session. The solutions is a much longer story. And most journalists really aren't that interested in the solutions, but you should know that there are solutions to all of this. So let's look at the real damage to US consumers. How much is it affecting them? How many people have been victimized? Well, we did a survey, um, and this is about 18 months old already, but it still seems every time I've done one of these surveys, I've done them for about five, six years, it shows pretty similar numbers that have been consistently getting a little worse over time. Um, and so what this chart is showing us is that about a third of all American adults have been a victim of some type of identity theft. Now, the word identity theft is a broad term to include all these categories. So the biggest category is theft of your credit card account, because they're so common and they're easy to get. Um, and you know, to tell you the truth, it's a real hassle when you get your credit card stolen, but it's not the end of the day, it's not the end of the world, because banks do a very good job protecting you 
and you have your credit card stolen. The main reason is they just charge the merchant. So they don't lose, the merchant loses, um, and the consumer gets their money back. And there's something called Regulation Z that protects consumers in credit card transactions, which is why we all feel pretty safe and we use credit cards as often as we can if we have credit cards. The second biggest category is ATM theft and debit card theft. Um, and then lower down, I just want to point out new account fraud. That's when a thief gets your personal information and opens up a new account, like a new loan. Um, and that's like a very difficult fraud to recover from. So if someone ends up taking out a mortgage in your name, it's very hard for you to uh, unravel that. And then you may get accused of not paying your mortgage on time and getting a bad credit history. And that's what all these credit monitoring services protect against. Um, and that's something that you don't want to have happen to you. The other thing that you really don't want to have happen to you is any kind of brokerage account transfer, anything out of your brokerage account, or anything out of your bank account. I mean, you don't want any of this, but if I had to rank them, I would take credit card first, then ATM cards, because you're protected by Visa and MasterCard rules. Then I'd worry about the bank accounts. Um, and then, you know, this is in order of increasing importance. And then the worst one, again, is new account theft. So all of this adds up to about 65 million people, adults, that have been affected by some sort of identity theft or scam in our survey. Um, it's really affected their behavior. It's affected their level of trust in email messages. So this, this chart is showing, you know, what did all this do to you? It's making them nervous about email. It's making them nervous about online shopping. Um, and it's affecting their online banking. So it's affecting pretty much everything that they do online. But most of all, their trust in email and online shopping. Let me stop you for a second, sure. because I think online shopping is, is interesting. You would think that that would be one of the primary ways to have your information, your financial information stolen. And yet, it wasn't something that you mentioned when you talked about the various scams. Mm -hmm. How safe is it? it? It seems like online shopping is almost safer than going to the ATM. I'm really glad you mentioned that, because I, wanted, I was just thinking that as we talked about it, it is safer. Everybody's so nervous about it, but it's much safer than going to uh, like a little ATM machine. The big ATM machines in the bank branches are usually pretty well equipped, but the ones at the airports or the little convenience stores are really, you know, I, I never use them. Gas pumps are much more dangerous than online shopping. They're perfect places for skimming. Anything that's unattended, like unattended terminals where there are no people around, those are prime targets for the criminals to put skimming machines in. And then they get, in many cases, you put your debit card in and you put your PIN and they can get the money out of your account. Online shopping, you never put a PIN in. So you either put your credit card or your debit card in. Sometimes you can also put PayPal and other uh, kinds of payment systems. You're very well protected with your credit debit card through the Visa and MasterCard rules, you have like usually zero liability. So if anyone does break into that online retailer's database to get that credit card number, you're really well protected. You're well protected even in the stores when you put your credit card in. But the reason why you're really safe is not just the protection. The bad guys don't care that much about the data they can capture from online shopping. Because all they can do is use it to shop online again. Because they're not getting the mag strike data from the back of the card. And that's what you need to like go into a store and get a prepaid card or to do a money transfer um, in person if you go into like a Western Union branch. You need that mag strike information is much more valuable. The information that you put online, you can't do much with it except shop online. Bad guys don't really like shopping online unless you see the electronics. So I don't need to go off into all these tangents, but I'm really glad you raised the question. Mm -hmm. Online shopping is not dangerous. Is it? Going to a gas pump is much better. 
So let's uh, conclude by looking at the status of legislative and regulatory efforts. We looked at the different kinds of cyber threats, cyber war, financially motivated attacks, damage to consumers. So what's our government doing about all this? And um, I'll just mention a few of the efforts out there. So Regulation E is a, a regulation that protects consumers from bank account theft. So when we looked at that account takeover, if it's against the consumer, consumers have rights and they can usually get their money back if they prove it wasn't them. And they also have to report it in a timely fashion. It's all documented um, in Reg E. That protection does not extend to anyone other than consumers. So it does not protect businesses, government agencies, or nonprofits. In fact, there was a case where $600,000 or more was stolen from a church, and they were not protected. I think the bank gave them the money back in that case. But it's all voluntary. So who, who gets hurt the most here? It's the small business. The large businesses either can absorb the loss, or frankly, they get reimbursed because no one wants to lose their business. But if you lose a small business account, you know, it's not the end of the world compared to losing a multi-billion dollar corporation. And so the small businesses are the ones that get squeezed. And that, I think, is a good story for the reporters out there who cover small business. Uh, I think it's important for them to know they are the ones most likely to be actually damaged mm -hmm. by this. So it's interesting that uh, Chuck Schumer, according to your slide, has made some efforts to extend this to small business, but so far it hasn't happened. gone anywhere. Like, so um, that's one to watch. And not only small, I think he was starting with nonprofits and government agencies, and um, nothing's happened. And frankly, the press has a major role because they only react to what the press thinks is important. At least from what I've well, seen. Thank you. We all want to think that we're that important, and I, uh, I agree with you. <laughs> well, it is true. I mean, you all know that. So this is something that's really uh, not covered by mainstream press. People don't understand it. If you talk to your friends that own small businesses, they probably have no idea that they're not protected if money's stolen from their account. And at least people should understand that. Um, the second point I want to make uh, mention of is the state breach disclosure laws. So one of the reasons that we read about breaches in the press is because almost every single state in the United States has a breach disclosure law that says if sensitive information is stolen and it's not encrypted, so sensitive information means driver's license, social security, bank account number, credit card number, and that's associated with a name or other address, personal attributes, then that has to be disclosed if it's not encrypted, which is the main reason we see disclosure. Now, there's no disclosure at a federal level, no disclosure laws. So that's been talked about for years, and it hasn't happened. And it's really important for companies that have to comply, because if you have a breach, let's say you're a national financial institution, you need an army of lawyers to go through all the state laws and figure out which law holds here. Sometimes you can go by the least common denominator, but it's a very complex web of legislation because each state has its own laws. Um, and so it would really be beneficial if there was an overarching federal law. There is one around health records called the High Tech Act, but there's nothing else other than that at the federal disclosure level. Then we have this national cybersecurity law that is now active again in the Senate. Um, and there's all kinds of uh, nuances to that. But that's about information sharing. So if uh, that's one aspect of it. So if someone, like let's say an electronic grid is being attacked by some nation state, they should be able to share with the government and other industry actors, look, we're getting attacked. This is what the attack looks like. And that law has been stalled in Congress for many, many months. And now the latest reason for stalling is because uh, uh, there was a proposal in a related information sharing act to send data on breaches to the NSA. And uh, you, know, you just mentioned that 
send information to the NSA and everybody kind of has an excuse to stop. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we're going to see anything this year for sure. Probably not next year either. <laughs> I think you're right. Anything that's stalled in progress is probably going to stay stalled in progress at this point. Yeah. Then we have the FSIEC guidance for online banking. So that is guidance issued by U.S. bank regulators. It's not regulation. And it just talks about strengthening controls around internet banking to prevent the kind of attacks we saw in the slides. Um, and that's been a good move, but it doesn't have that much teeth um, because if you're not in compliance, it's not, uh, it's just like a check mark. It's not really um, regulation, it's just guidance. And then we have the PCI data security standards that you may have heard of. That's not regulation. It's not legislation. Those are the rules of the credit card networks to protect their brands, like Visa and MasterCard. Um, and that's a pretty good security standard. But it only applies to payment cards. It doesn't apply to personal information, telephone records, bank account information. So the credit card industry does a good job of protecting itself because it's motivated financially, but there's no one out there writing similar rules when there isn't that kind of financial incentive. So in summary, there's lots of different cyber threats. So when you talk about cybersecurity, there's so many different threats, there's so many different actors. There is considerable damage, but it's not statistically measured. Um, I often get asked, how much is this costing? And there really is no central reporting. Nobody has to disclose the extent of the losses centrally. So um, it's really very difficult to come up with numbers. The legislative and regulatory efforts, as we've seen, are lacking. We didn't talk about the solutions, but we do have the technology to beat these threats. But you need financial support. You need organizational support to implement. And finally, we didn't really talk about privacy at all. Um, and that's a whole other presentation. But generally speaking, in the United States, financial institutions at least are allowed to collect as much data as they need to protect someone's account, but they're not allowed to use it for any other purposes. So privacy takes a second a back seat to security when it comes to protecting financial assets. Now, those kind of rules are not established for other information, like telephone records and payment records, but that's a whole nother issue. But in general, the less privacy you have, the more security you can foster. And I hate to make that statement, but it's true. Right. So we're, yeah. we're all looking for that happy medium. Yeah. Right. We, we have a question about credit card security from someone who travels internationally. Mm -hmm. And the question is, why, when you go to Europe, is it difficult sometimes to have a U.S. credit card? Mm -hmm. European merchants seem to want some kind of extra PIN number or level of security. Do they have a different system? Yeah, that's a great question. So the whole world has moved, pretty much the whole world has moved to chip cards except the United States. Chip cards? Yes. Now, chip cards, when we talked about that theft against the Michaels, the retailer, when they went in to skim the card, they all like to get that mag stripe data on the back of the card. So the credit card networks understood this, and they came out with a new standard called EMV, or Euro MasterCard Visa, Euro Pay MasterCard Visa, that puts a smart chip on the card. So now it becomes almost impossible for me to clone your card. Today, I can clone your card because it's mag stripe, and I can just feed that mag stripe data on the back of your card. But if you had a chip, it's almost impossible to clone it. So it's much better security, and the whole world has moved to it, except for the United States and a couple countries in Africa. So the Europeans don't want to take those mag stripe cards because if it's a stolen card, they get stuck with the, the money lost the liability. So why would I want to use Linda's MagStrike card when it could be a criminal that cloned your card and I'm going to have to pay for the loss? Very, very interesting and important for travelers to know. Is there, is there anything you can do as a U.S. traveler? Can, can you request that your company give you a chip card? Yeah, some banks are giving chip cards out to travelers, so you should ask your bank for that. 
an easier thing to do is when you're in the airport, just buy one of those prepaid chip cards, get them at the, like the American Express or Travel X booth, and you just put a lot of money on that, and hopefully you don't lose it, and you remember the pin, and then you can use it everywhere. I'm, I'm doomed, that's it. <laughs> I think there's a recourse action if you lose it, you can disable it. No. Um, here's another question. You talked about malware carried to your smartphone in an app, which is pretty terrifying to those of us who are so excited about our smartphones and we're just downloading every cool app we find. How do you know? Is there any way to tell which apps might be more trustworthy if you get them directly from the app store on your phone? Is it, is it how do you know? The truth is you don't know. Um, and that's why the Apple uh, iTunes store does the best job of vetting those applications. So they are like, they do the most scrutiny. All these other Android stores don't do that level of security and scrutiny. So you really don't know. There is something called app store scanning. So companies like big consumer brands or banks are hiring these other companies to go through all the app stores and get rid of the applications that are bad that are using their brand. But you can't count on that working as a consumer and you may be downloading a game that has no brand. So really there's not a lot you can do. Just buyer, downloader, beware when right. it comes to that. I was interested in your discussion of botnets, these sort of networks of mm -hmm computers that are put together by hackers. Is it, is it possible to know if your own, say, your home PC is has become part of a botnet? Is there any well, one way you know is if it's really slow. So if you find that something's really slowing down, that's a very good indication because they're sometimes they're using you to send a lot of traffic, but not always. It could be a little traffic. The best way for you to protect against that is to get really good anti-malware software. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't really want to mention names on this program, but you can call me later, I'll tell you who <laughs> yes. Okay. And most of them are not the main brands that you've heard of. You know, like the ones that you, you all know have not been so The ones that come preloaded on my computer right. are probably not the best. Right. Well, Aviva's contact inf information is uh, on our website, so feel free to, to call her and talk about that. What if you have a computer, not, not that this would be my situation, you put it to sleep at night, and when you wake up in the middle of the night and walk into your office, you find that your computer is lit up, mm -hmm. and I mean, you can't see anything happening on it, but it's it's awake. Mm -hmm. Does it do that by itself? Does that have some sort of electrical? Could that be evidence that it's someone else who's doing it? There could be evidence your screensaver is programmed to wake up. So mm -hmm. it may just be the settings on your computer, and mm -hmm. not really an indication of bad activity, because the bad guys can do it and keep the lights off. Ah, okay. as they're, long as they're more clever than that. Yeah, as long as you're connected to the network, they can do whatever they want. They're not showing. Tell us, what is the difference between being a breach and an actual intrusion? You had an early, right. early slide um, that I unfortunately edited for you. Yeah, that's okay. Um, it took, took out the, the mm -hmm. difference. So, can you clarify that? Yeah, a breach is a known case of someone going in, a bad guy, and actually stealing information. So they've actually taken something out, like either a bunch of credit card records, email addresses. An intrusion is they're in there and we don't really know what they've done yet. They, they, we haven't seen anything other than they're in our network. Now, sometimes they go hand in hand. Right, an intrusion might happen before, before the breach. Right. So. Monitor the intrusion. 
Right. I mean, they're usually intruding to steal something, but sometimes they're just watching and trying to figure out what your network looks like. You um, had a great slide that showed the underwater, the other physical underwater cable. And I guess there are lots of those mm -hmm. now connecting us worldwide. And you mentioned that there were some divers. Uh, were they Egyptian divers? Or yeah, were they I divers? think they were Egyptian. You know, you're sharp. <laughs> I knew you were anyway, so I'm not sure they were Egyptian. They were off the coast, off of, the Egypt. coast of Egypt. They may have been Egyptian. We, we, we never heard about that. Yeah. I mean, unless I missed it. It didn't it didn't make big news, but that seems to me such a fascinating story. Mm -hmm. Who's watching those cables? How do right. they watch them? And how often do they find people down there trying to cut the cable? I mean, it's like something out of a James Bond movie. It is. It is, actually. And it was in the news. I actually found the reports, but mm -hmm. it wasn't in the main news. Yeah. Um, the financial services industry in the United States actually created a map of all these cables. Mm -hmm. And where the sensitive points are, but they're not being guarded. You know, the way they find out they're cut is the internet service provider like loses connectivity. Right. So if they, I don't know if they're being watched. I mean, maybe our government's watching them and not telling us, but at least in terms of what the public knows, they're not really being watched. Hmm. So it was coincidental. They just have guards around the coast. This was something that was very close to the coast. That's how they caught them. And it could be that because they tried it a few months earlier, they kept cars around there. But there's, you can imagine there's infinite points, almost infinite points where these can be cut. And then there's some points that are much more important than others. They're not being watched. As as I um, a viewer asks, can you explain how the hacker is able to hide the fact that he or she has taken money out of your bank account online. So we are mentioning it. Yeah. They just they they basically, it. yeah, it's a great question. They're all great questions. They manipulate the HTML code. So the code that creates these web pages is all in the clear. And so a criminal can easily dissect that code and figure out what it's doing and manipulate it. Um, and they can also put up what's called iframes that like superimposes their screen on top of the real screen. So they can just have like a fake screen on top of the one that you're looking at that doesn't show you the results. So HTML is a big weakness the way our web technology works. It can be dissected, reverse engineered, manipulated, and you can put something on top of it. And uh, that to mimic, because they reverse engineer it, they know which field goes where. They can create a duplicate screen that goes right on top. Looking here. Well, just to wrap up, do you have any practical advice for people who want to protect their own bank and credit card accounts? What should we all consider? Yeah, it's interesting. It always comes down to like the very individual concerns. You know, I could just tell you what I do. Not practical advice. It's not always the best for America, but it's good for me. <laughs> so I always use my credit card whenever I can because I have the most protection here. If I have to use my debit card, I never put my pin in, and that's where it's a little selfish because if I put my pin in, the merchant pays much lower cost, but I get less protection. That's what I'm saying. It's not always the best thing. America. It would be much better for the merchants to get low cost than for me to be protected. But if you're worried about yourself, which you should, you know, use your credit card whenever you can. Use your debit card. Don't put a pin in unless you have to. If you're really paranoid, don't enable online banking transfers. Don't have wire transfers out of your account. Don't use bill payment. Don't turn on any payment transfers. Uh, so if someone got in, they couldn't do anything. Convenient that we love, we probably shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, here's a question. I, this is a follow up question now on the um, hiding money that's been taken from your account. And the question is when would you realize that your money was actually gone? That's another great question. So I don't know how long they keep those iframes running. 
But at some point, probably it only works for a couple of days because you're going to have other transactions you expect to see, and they're not going to keep rewriting that screen. They're only trying to cover themselves up enough that they can get the money out without being reported. And that usually takes two to three days. They transfer it to what's called a mule account, like a stocking grant, and then they go overseas. And then when it's overseas, then it's too late to get the money back once it's handed. So it's probably two, three days. Okay, we are going to leave the chat box open for about 10 minutes. So if you have additional questions now, you can go ahead and keep typing them into the chat box. Um, and in the meantime, we're also going to put up a series of poll questions. This is our way of surveying you to see how useful this webinar was. And we would ask you to just click on those questions and give us some quick answers that will help us as we plan future webinars to make sure that they're as useful as they possibly can be. Uh, in the meantime, Aviva Leighton uh, from Gartner Research, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. It's been fascinating. Thank really you. Really good information. I think there's some good story ideas here, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I hope you're contacted by some of our viewers later. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, please remember that we will have a recorded version of this, which will push out to your email if you registered in advance. And if not, you'll be able to find it on our website, which is www.nationalpress.org. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.